use their birth names. Yes. So I get it in principle because they'd be saying, right. you know, I want to make it easier for this non-Mandarin speaker to address me. Yeah. But I always think names are really important. It is actually. We are live. We're ju- jumping into the conversation talking about names and words actually because yeah. uh, we're just getting this right and I'm, and I'm sorry, I'm not, I, I'm very, very, I find it a really important thing to get names right. Fair so enough. your same as Kamali. Kamali, yes. Kamali. Yes. Um, Darren Kamali. Yeah. Um, and I was, we we're just talking about it. I, 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 sometimes when in, uh, like a, a, a Chinese national comes to New Zealand to do English, they'll change their first name to an English word. Yes. But right. it's not always an English name. No. Like I knew a, a, a young fella, a young kid here, who, called his, who changed his first name to Coke. Oh, okay. So he went by <laughs> Coke. Wow. Um, That's an easy one. <laughs> yeah, but, but they just went, oh, there's a popular uh, popular. English word, we'll use that. But I've always found names to be incredibly Im- important. You know, I know people yes. who they have difficult names to pronounce. I'm not saying that yours, <laughs> yeah. but they do. And their opinion was always, you know, if people who don't know me get it wrong, no big deal. But if friends of mine aren't pronouncing my name correctly, it's it's sort of insulting. Yeah, fair enough. And yes. I also think, you know, the the mean the meaning behind the name. Yes. Like one of my kids was born, my eldest was born, and when she came out, um, her, the baby had been obviously pressing on the on some of the her mother's pelvis area, and she had a V on her forehead. Oh wow! And it was pressed on there like a it wasn't a birthmark because it wasn't permanent. Yeah. But the doctor, like Chris, the yeah. doctor said, um, "What a fantastic V! Another victory baby." And oh. that's what he had called them when they came out because apparently oh, wow. it's not that uncommon. Yeah. So um, this child of mine's middle name references it's references that point the victory baby oh. so that's important yes, you know it's important it and 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 that's not a difficult name to get wrong but that's why i always think that names and their meanings behind them have relevance yeah especially for coming from the pacific as well and being sort of brought up by a christian family and, yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so the dory yeah my name is darren uh but my actual latin name by my godmother who's cook island nun she was the one who named me and it's dari chris which is like a uh, a gift of miracle child and then the second name is kamali which is kamali Eli. we cut it down to kamali it's from uh over here in futuna wallace and futuna so my grandfather I took my grandfather's name uh kamali yeah so that means your name darren that you're using now is it actually your birth name is that what's on your birth certificate it's on my birth certificate but i've named my little boy Dari uh, after my real yeah um, latin name yeah right so you have like a name that was given to you and then a legal name as well yes is that is that Sorry. part of the Fijian culture? Uh, it's part. I guess it's a Christian thing as well. Because you have a Christian name, and then you have your 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 birth certificate name as well. Right. Yeah, oh so. well, see, I was, I was raised Catholic. Okay. And that's why I'm Patrick because oh, it's yes. St. Pat- and, and my mother's parents were out of Northern Ireland. Oh. Wow. So yeah. Patrick, you, you can't get away from it. In fact, her middle name was she recently passed. Her middle name was Patricia. All oh, right. And my sisters, I'm just going to think this is going to be embarrassing. Um, I think one of their middle names is. Patricia, yeah, as like this, this, this Patrick goes so through the whole it, family. Yeah, that's right, and, and and so that's and that ties back to my heritage. So names are important. That's right. It's funny you say that because uh, in uh, Wallace and Fortuna, the island of Fortuna was Saint, Saint Peter Chanel, so they are part French as well. Yeah, because they have been influenced by French, uh, colonized by French. So the religion came in there, and uh, most of our family is named after either boy or girl would be named Chanel after the the, the patron saint, right. uh, Peter Chanel. Yeah. And uh, because he was killed in, uh, on our island of Futuna. Okay. So um, uh, one of the uh, chief's uh, warrior, Musumusu, killed him. And then, but because he was such an amazing man and, and stuff like that, so he said to bury him in front of the church so people can walk on him. And then all all the people on that island are all Catholics, uh, both islands, over here in Futuna. And then they choose to, over the generations, at least one person or one female or male in their family will be named Chanel. Wow. Yeah, so you might find that out when you see some of those people from over here in Futuna. So when you said bury him in front of the church so people can walk over him, was that... Because that sounds quite disrespectful, but was it a sign of respect? Meaning, yes. we want we want him as a part of our journey, or was it like he's a pile of crap? Let's step on him. Yeah, he, it was his, actually his request. He was in remorse after that what he's done to the, the saint, and right. then he asked them to to bury him in there so they can actually walk on him as like his penance or right. something like that. After that, that. See, there's the Catholic, okay, the yes, penance. That's right. Yeah, you don't thing. know much about the Catholic Confession Church. Confession and yeah, penance. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. It's like a, 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 the whole thing of purgatory that, that's that right. you yeah. have, even after you die. 
there is things to do to get right. That's right. To, That's crazy. To yeah, right yeah. Is yeah. there something that still is a part of your life today? Like, or is it a part of your upbringing which still influences you like the religious aspect yes actually because i stay um i moved back with my mom she had cancer back in 2016 and she's a very staunch catholic and Mm -hmm. coming from fiji a very staunch catholic as well um yeah so i grew up a altar boy and same went to maris brothers school and stuff like that maris brothers (laughs) yeah same (laughs) maris brothers i went to uh maris brothers and a christian brothers secondary school i can't remember which is which i think st peter's College in Auckland. Yes, was mm, Christian Brothers. Yeah, Christian Brothers. Christian, oh, and then that, Sacred yeah. Heart is Maris Brothers. Maris Brothers. Yes. I think. Yeah, I get those. Confused. It probably makes sense. Mar- anyway. yeah. And of course, I had to support the Maris Rugby Club when I was in, oh, living def- in Auckland. Definitely, because yeah. every Catholic does. Yeah, it's us. Yeah. Is that something that you then pass on to your kid? Your kid, kids. What? How many? How many children? Uh, I've got two boys and two step boys as well. Right, with, uh, Carmel and I. And um, yeah, I. Uh, Get them well. I, I'm not a practicing, really going to church kind of person. But when mom goes to church, I, I get the boys to go with her as well. Right. Just to yeah, do the thing. So mom's still with us. Yeah, yeah. Oh I'm great. So had had cancer, but still with yeah, us. Yeah, she comes through. She came through remission oh, uh, a couple of years ago. Yeah, that's amazing. Yes, yes. It, uh, yeah, it's um, it's interesting. I heard a conversation with someone the other day. I I'm someone who just ingests content. Like, you know, you've, I mean, Tom will tell you, you see me, I'm wearing my headphones or I'm, I'm always listening to something or always, there's just content going all the time. Yeah. And I heard a conversation between two people talking about the woke culture. You know, talk about the woke That's culture. That's right, I heard of that, eh? Yeah. And, and the woke, and, and they, it was really interesting talking about how since um, religious instruction and sort of adherence to a religion yeah. has dropped the rise of the woke culture is, is is up, and it's yeah. almost like it's becoming the new religion. That's right. I with guess things the next like generation it's un- is. unquestionable. Yeah. You know, there are some uh, charismatic leaders. That's right. You know, if you if you don't, you know, if you're not in, then you're basically going to whatever the version of hell is. You know, <laughs> yeah, that's it's right. really, it's really interesting. Wow. It's like even when there's not religion, people are finding religion to fill fill that space. Yeah, maybe. Okay. Yeah. And do you think walk is sort of equivalent to consciousness, or that's no? as woke? I think. For, I mean, I'm, I was going to say people who don't know. I mean, most people yeah. know what it is, but the woke culture is sort of uh, um, seen as that kind of far, far, far left ideology of That's right. of um, gosh, I wouldn't even bring that up. Bring up a <laughs> bring up a definition of woke, Tommy, awesome. just to see what exactly it says. Yep. I, can, I mean, I can think of what a woke. Like I saw a conversation the other day. Um, it seems to be amongst millennials and uh, and Generation Z, and it seems to be attached a little bit to that sort of attitude of, of entitlement as well. It's like, what does it say? So woke, uh, a political term uh, of African-American origin, I didn't know that, uh, refers to a, per, a perceived awareness of issues concerning social justice and racial justice. It was derived from the African-American vernacular English expression, stay woke. Those grammatical aspects uh, referen- refer to a continuing awareness of these issues. See, that sounds fantastic. Well, yeah, but actually, true. when you see it in practice, <laughs> it can be a very so different, different thing. Yeah. So that's probably their origins of it. But then, oh, because look, that talks about early 20th century. Yeah. But then it goes to an extreme, and it's a very strange culture. But it is interesting how when something in society dies, something will replace it. That's right. And I guess I, a replacement. I guess I'm not saying what culture is a replacement for religion. I'm just saying that's a conversation I heard the other day, and it made me kind of go, "Oh, Keeps and the, balance, I guess." And they yeah. had the. It was actually by a comedian who um, started up a Twitter handle, I think called uh, Miss Titania. If you look up Miss Titania, <laughs> and Titania, I think, is a Shakespearean character. I was oh, going to say okay. Midsummer Night's Dream. Yes. May not be. And um, it's T I, Tania. Oh, yeah. And it's fake. It's a completely fake account. Oh, wow. But this account would say the most, um, like the wokest things you could and got a really big following and all these people taking it seriously. Yeah. But it was a comedian taking the piss, basically. <laughs> and he was the guy talking about how he could see, how he could see what he was experience, um, experiencing that was the was the equivalent of what he used to experience in religion when he was a kid. Just try T-I, T-A-N-I-A, Titania. I'm pretty sure that's what oh, it is. Titania. Yeah. On Twitter. That's no, that's probably it. Just on that one, Titania McGrath. 
That's probably it. I'll tell you because I'll recognize it. Yeah, that's it. Wow. That's it. So she's an activist, a healer, a racial intersectionalist poet, selfless and brave. By Where's my she book. from? It's, she's not a real person. It's a oh, guy. So. It's, a, it's a comedian in the oh, UK. Oh, that's right. You see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So and and she, and she he yeah. was outed uh, about a year ago. Um, but got a quite a big following of people thinking and that. And then he he was like that for a while, and then yeah. didn't tell anyone. <laughs> and apparently, this person part of you know how they all have comedians all have their own angle. He's apparently got another half dozen fake Ooh. profiles oh, wow. on the internet. It's pretty spicy. This guy. What does it say? <laughs> Any form of segregation of sexes in sports and schools and toilet facilities anywhere at all <laughs> is a reprehensible form of gender apartheid. So that's a good woke statement. We're yeah. all equal to the nth degree, no matter what. Yeah. And I guess you know. Not to get into a conversation about whether that's right or wrong. That's an opinion held by that's right. many people. Yes, and yeah. they common, would be considered opinion. woke. Yeah. yeah. Oh, anyway, <laughs> so you are a, a a writer and a poet. Yes. Um, a poet. You look to have done some pretty interesting things, heading off to getting a writer in residence in Hawaii and that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, I wrote my second book in Hawaii, uh, 2012. Yeah. Where I was uh, the Pacific uh, Writers in Residence at that uh, university. I guess every year there's a writer in residence, and uh, last year was Oscar Kitely. Yeah, oh so, really? So it's been yeah, it's been coming through, and even uh, I think Victor Rogers has been on that as well. So there's been some big names. Pr- yeah. Pretty good place to get a writer, writer in residence. Oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> <isn't> it? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I wrote my second collection of books. But while I was there, um, they called me up from Ukraine and uh, emailed me. They well, wanted, oh, pause. What were you doing in the Ukraine? <laughs> no, no, I was in Hawaii at the time. Oh, you're in Hawaii. Writing my second book. Right. And then uh, and the Ukraine came a calling. And you, Ukraine came, emailed me, and they said, "Oh, we've, we saw your first book, uh, Tales, Poems, and Songs from the Underwater World, and we're really interested in it." And they wanted to translate it and um, launch it in Ukraine. Wow. In uh, 2013. So I was like wandering far out. I'm here in Hawaii. I'm this little Fijian boy just uh, starting off with my writing. And I wonder what they want me for in Ukraine. I guess because they were so far away from the ocean. And um, okay. most of my writing is about the ocean as yeah. well. And um, and that's probably what connected them. So they got me, yeah, translated my work. And then, uh, yeah, I was there in 2013 to launch. How do you, as an author, make sure it's an accurate translation? If you can't speak the language... Because, yeah. I mean, I would think within English, and sp- certainly within someone who was uh, born and raised in Fiji yeah. and then came to New Zealand as a teenager, yeah. um, not only do you have your native language, you've yeah. then got your English language. English. Your English will then be influenced by your native language. Yes. So it's like there's even stuff within, I assume, within your your own English language, yeah. how you speak and how you your turn of phrase would have influence from Fijian. Yes, their accent. Which yeah. means it's like two steps already to get to English, and then that has to go to another one, which is Ukrainian. Ukrainian, yes. How does you, how do you check to make sure like all the turn of phrase is accurate and fair and well uh, represented? Yeah, we had to work closely with um, Ukraine because my, not just Fijian uh, bilingual in my my poems, but I use Maori and Pacific Island languages like Tongan and Samoan. So, mm. Yeah, t- talking about myths and legends around yeah, yeah. my poetry as well. But uh, yeah, I guess growing up in Fiji, we grew up uh, English speaking in school, yep. and um, and even the brothers used to, we used to have Fijian and religion classes as well. So we got taught Fijian at school as well by white Maris brothers right. as well. <laughs> so uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, when I came to New Zealand, I was pretty already established in sort of English speaking as yep. well, and um, yeah, and then going to Ukraine was yeah, it had to be like a whole year of corresponding between Is that us. Right? Yeah, email back and forth. Oh, what's this word? And and it might be a Maori word or. or oh. No, a Fijian mm. word, and then it was like, okay, it, it means sea or something in English. But I guess, yeah, with the language, it's so hard to translate from the language into English. Oh. Well, I wonder as well, like, I mean, I think straight away about the word Fano. Fano is uh, doesn't actually mean family, it's sort of bigger, yes. So, so if, yeah. if, if that was if in the Ukraine, they say, now what does this word Fano mean? Well, however yeah. they would pronounce it or say it back to you, you'd have to write kind of a paragraph to explain it's encapsulating, like that, yeah. It's, I, I like and they it's find a word for what that means in Ukrainian, is that yeah, sort of that's right? Because it, it won't just mean a nuclear family, it yeah. literally mean that extended family, yeah, yeah, and know, community almost, and community or yeah. village, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. village. <laughs> so it goes out like that, even like the the, the kyoro or the mbula, yeah, it's got a spiritual essence, it's more life than than saying hello, yeah. So when you say mbulovinaka, it means good life. Life, yeah, know? and then it, it means hello as well. Because if you translate that directly, it basically means hello, thank you. Yes, <laughs> which it doesn't. is thank you or good. Yeah, so good uh, life. Yeah, so yeah, bula yeah. means life, and then and vinaka in that context is is, the, is uh, good life. Eh? So it it's needs good. to have the context. You can't just literally read the two words. Yeah. So uh, like uh, 
Nisambula is the this thing, yeah. And then vinaka, like you said, is good, yeah. But nisambula vinaka is like a combination of the, the wow. Both, yeah. I always was told that nisambula is like a more formal way of it's like it's a like greeting. saying hello, yeah. how are you? Yeah. Whereas bull is just like hi, yeah. That's know, right. Sort of yeah, like hey, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But the other way is a formal way of like okay. Yeah. Especially if you see someone of uh, you know hierarchy or oh, Nissan oh, okay. you know, a different respect. Eh? Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so like a, a, a chief or someone, yeah, a dignitary. So you see, you'd, you'd but if you talk to a mate, hey, Mbulo, bro, you yeah. know, like that. Uh, but when as soon as you see somebody older, or a priest or a pastor, oh, Nissan Bulovina, you get that reference and uh, you know a little bit of respect in there as well. Which is, which is the same. I mean, me and my kids often talk about language and. Uh, you know, it's a silly example because it's not going to happen. But we're like, if you're in front of the, we we're talking about swearing the other day. Oh, okay. And it's like I'm not. I'm, I swearing doesn't particularly bother me. But there's a time and a place. Yes. And I was talking about you know if, if my dad. They call my dad Papa. If Papa was sitting here, you know that language wouldn't. Necess- and I was like, imagine you're in front of the Queen. Yeah. You know, you wouldn't. You wouldn't use that language there. That's so right. it has yeah. a it has a context to yeah. where you're at as well, which is That's I guess, right. I guess even with like. your kids conversating with you, you can you can sort of sense that respect from your kids. No, not so much. Not me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> or somebody older, yeah, you know, yes. yeah. maybe a teacher. <laughs> um, so as a writer, um, how does that influence what you're writing? I mean, you primarily are writing Pacific stories? Yes. So most of my stuff is uh, about the Pacific. It's yeah. about the islands and the city, the old and the new, and traditional contemporary sort of mixing into the Tsugasai. Yeah, like I said, uh, I told you personally before, I came to Aotearoa when I was 17. Mm-hmm. And uh, I guess the only way, I was wanting to tell my stories of how I grew up in you know, I have all these fond memories. And then I, yeah, I met this guy in Auckland when I moved up in 98. Uh, I started uh, basking on the streets. <laughs> his name is uh, Moa Strix and Poor. I think his son is, uh, his son is Feletti, who is a Nijian mystic. Mm-hmm. Uh, so um, he got me off, uh, sort of, I, I was looking for a way out. And yeah, I wasn't doing anything. I was just staying up on Karanga Hyper Road, uh, sort of flatting <laughs> over there. And then he said, oh, come on to this top course, uh, training opportunity course through uh, Winds, New Zealand. And then, uh, yeah, and then I got writing. He said, oh, I didn't know much about rap back then because I was from a Fijian background and mm-hmm. reggae was the thing. Mm-hmm. And then he said, no, no, you won't be singing. I know you got a good voice, but you'll be doing uh, well, something called rap. And at the time, Feletti, who's MC Sabre from Nijian Mystic, he was, I think he was only 14 years old. I was wow. about 22, 23. And I was the youngest in the group. The oldest was, 20, uh, was 58. But he was the one coming in with his dad doing workshops on how to write poetry and, and rap and put it into songs and stuff like that. Yeah. And that's sort of how it began back in 98. And uh, yeah, sort of. And I just took it on and I made two albums out of that. Um, 2000, I did Bula Aotearoa. And uh, in 2005, I did Keep It Real, an EP album that was all supported by Creative New Zealand as well. So uh, yeah, so it started on the streets. I mean, really there and then I developed from there. And, so before yeah. you started talking with those people started you know performing with those people yeah were you like when you're growing up were you a writer were you a creative writing kid did, was um, it your favorite class at school did you love to write things? i loved writing yeah, actually i have english uh, was my yeah my most sort of a uh, uh, prominent subject at school mm-hmm. and uh, yeah i'd love i used to love telling stories because we had english literature and we had english comprehension and that's how i sort of but i'd never really tapped into poetry at this sort of how I did when I came to Aotearoa. And um, yeah, it's until I came here then I started to develop that, oh yes, uh, this is a thing called poetry. Mm-hmm. And then I started with the street poetry and I guess it came naturally because our ancestors are you know, natural orators. We yeah. never wrote stuff. So um, their performance was the thing that really got me into um, getting back onto the page. So I think I'm more of a spoken word or performance poet before I was the, um, the written poet as well. Yeah. Do you think that that's... Um obviously that oral language and, and, and dating back that what you're doing now is sort of the 2020 version of what people were doing a thousand years ago. That's right. And so you're you're writing and performing, but this is now you're actually recording as well. Yes, and this is like the modern day uh, poet, but you know, sort of like I said, I'm trying to mix the traditional with the contemporary and um, yeah, bring it back to the new as well. Yeah. It's, it's There's something really powerful about that spoken history though, eh? Just about learning language, it's a silly example, but I was watching, when I grew up, uh, The Young Ones television show from the UK, yeah. comedy show, was like my favourite show in the world. And I happened to catch oh, a documentary the other day um, on YouTube about The Young Ones. It was 90 minutes, I'm just like, oh, and I was back in my childhood. And every clip they showed, I could still recite. 
that's that's funny. Like I could, could still in. recite, and yeah. I was just thinking, holy moly! I probably haven't watched any of these since the nineties. But it just triggers and it comes and back. And I could in. remember, and you kind of go, you can see how that oral history can live and can be accurate. Yeah. I've told this story before on here. I think it was David Attenborough doing a, a documentary on the Great Barrier Reef. It okay. may even be on Netflix. Yeah. Um, and he tells a story about the indigenous people in that area having an oral history, a story yeah. of a of a great flood. Yeah. And they found out with technology just in the last, who knows, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, once they could map the um the the seafloor properly yeah that they could see where the coastline used to be and actually this four thousand two thousand whatever year uh, old oral story yeah matches Lives this new technology it. going ah oh, so this is where the flood was that's right yeah and actually the oral history the storytelling the the, the I, I don't know how they tell it but one would assume with the Aboriginal people it's probably in dance and in song and in storytelling yeah has been accurate for. I'm going to get this wrong, but either hundreds, if not thousands of years, yeah. however long that story That's is. That's right. And they and, pass it on to generations as well. So and the time. European had to wait for the 21st century <laughs> yeah. to invent technology. technology to be able to prove the story that's been told for hundreds of years. That's right, yeah. And th- I guess that's what um, people are so fascinated about, the wayfinding and um, the navigation of our ancestors as well through the Pacific. And um, they would think, oh, where's the charts? How come the other generations carried on the tradition? Yeah. But it's from the chant. It's from the, they, they put chants together so people can remember to the next generation oh okay so this is what he used this is how he saw the birds or this is how he saw the currents and the, the stars and and then it's all in the the chant or even in the making of a tapa or and you know it's a hand of it's like for us we'll write it down and put it in archives but for our people they were just orators and they passed it on and if we didn't pass it on then that's where it sort of died off yeah and yeah. And, the, and the problem with archives is archives can be destroyed well, as can right. spoken language but yeah. like i said you know young ones came out in, I think it was 1981 and 1984. Yes. Um, I was only seven at the time, but yep. I obviously picked up on it in the late 80s when I was a teenager. That's right. And I still remember it today. And uh, same as a song, you know, it's yes. like you're like those songs. Like I remember It'll growing up in, in Catholic school and you learn a <laughs> Catholic hymn yep. and you haven't heard it for 35 years and That's you hear right. it and you still will pick up from there yeah, yeah. it's like yeah. riding a bicycle yeah. you know it's like yeah. so the, the chants are, you know i would imagine are just the the version of a song or a or, or a spoken yeah. part that's correct yeah that stays around forever that's right yeah does that mean that the and obviously in this day and age we 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 want written resources we want books and poetry we want that so but is there an element of it which sort of takes away from the creativity as well like is there like um i've seen on youtube some of your spoken word yeah. and some of it looks you know, it, it's quite visceral. It's quite it's um, a part of how you do it. Yeah, is the way. Do you do you lose a lot when someone picks up a book and just reads it? Yeah, it's frozen actually on the book, so frozen, you okay. can't you can't actually change those words mm. and you can't change the person's thinking of that unless he's seen you perform. But when I, I I can see, it won't be particularly performed the same way it's written on the page. Yeah. So when it comes to the stage, that person who's performing it doesn't have to be you will make it their own and then you can change it up you can put more words into it more actions or take it away and that's a good thing about performances you can be flexible but on the page once you've done it once you published it you can't yeah. change it and it's frozen and you know and that's done and then for the next how many generations will they read it there we go find it this is on your <laughs> where was this film there was this film in uh, auckland sort of um the hillsborough so, down that way yeah that's where i grew up i grew um, up in Monaco, um, harvard the back there yeah yeah See, there's a lot of there's a lot of feeling in this as well. Yes, it's like I remember someone saying to me once we were talking about reading books. Yeah, and they brought up you know some Shakespearean. Yeah, and I said Shakespeare didn't write his stuff to be read though. No, he wrote it, was it to be performed. Yes, yeah, and it's yeah. A, there's a difference as well. Yeah, so picking up Midsummer Night's Dream or whatever. Yeah, and, and you can get it in a bookshop now. That's right. Yeah, that's not the intention. It's, it's, no, it's, the yeah. intention was for it to be performed. Watch it live. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I guess most there's a lot of spoken word of poets as well. Uh, being South Auckland Poets Collective, yep. a founder. 
I found that yeah, it's a, there's a difficulty, especially with the performers come trying to come to the page or the page trying yeah. to come to performance. So there'll be a difference in there. People, some there's only a few people who can master both. Yeah, and then there's especially the younger ones who's trying to transition from performing into the, onto the page. It's, there's a little bit of a challenge there as well. It seems yeah. to be maybe the equivalent of I mean we've just had Elton John here in the city Wonderful. and he's got Bernie Taupin who's so Elton's the words yeah and Bernie Taupin's the music it's that's like, right it seems like there is a there's also the written for the poet yeah. there's the written word yeah and there's the performance you may do you get people who are good at one but not the best at the other yeah I've, I've, I mean I've worked with a lot of poets and young poets as well but uh, yeah I've seen that, that that sort of trait and a few spoken word artists will come to me and say oh I want to do a book bro I said, oh, okay, come, let's sit down, and then we try and work out something. And then it really depends on them what they want on their books. I mean, they know what they want as a performer. Yeah. Oh, I can perform this, I can bring this to life. But what? how can I do it on the book, or how can I? Yeah. Because you have to put a lot, you know how, how uh, you have to structure your poems. Yeah. You know, it's, and like when you perform, you know how it moves, and you want to move it on the page as well. And then depends on the structure of your poem and stuff like that. So, yeah, I guess that's what I do when I try and workshop and mentor some of our young ones. And, yeah. So you work uh, at the moment. I read that you were working in in the library system. Is that what you're doing? Yes, I'm the senior curator Pacific for Auckland Library. Pacific content into most of them. Wow, cool. But I'm curating our first uh, Pacific heritage collections for Auckland Libraries, and that's opening on the 13th of March. Sorry, 17th of March to July 20th, and that's going to include all the archives that I work with. I work with a lot of uh, Polynesian archives, Pacific archives, and we're trying to bring those islands out into the fore for the next sort of yeah, three months. So if you're talking about a museum, which you're not, but if you were, mm. I think about an archive, I think about a back room full of artifacts. Yes. If you're talking about archives within a library context, what, what are they? We're talking about like ephemeras, manuscripts, images, photographs, and um, yeah, maps. Um, yeah, most of that. And then and like museums are more tangible, you can touch them, yeah. you can hold them. But this one's more in scripts and writing and, and um, yeah. And stuff like that but what i'm doing with this because i worked in the museum as well for four okay. years <laughs> before i got this job at the library and i'm a revival research artist as well doing a sort of ulumate project which is the hair wig making fijian wig making so i'm uh, collaborating with the maritime museum uh, auckland war memorial museum and the archives of uh, maori and pacific sounds and music from uh, auckland university mm -hmm. so those are the the different um, institutions that i'm be collaborating with on this uh, yeah, on this uh, exhibition, Way to Atel. Wow. So the exhibition's going to involve all of those areas museum, yeah. library. A collaboration around there, but the libraries, we have 14 Pacific specialists, Talano yeah. Group, which yeah. runs across the libraries. And we've taken uh, Terangi Hiro's uh, philosophy about the octopus, the heads being in Tahiti and the tentacles spread across the Pacific. So I've taken that philosophy and I've put the head in the central gallery. Mm -hmm. And then our specialists will be doing response to the exhibition. Oh, cool from their different libraries to the Waitoya Te, the saltwater realm from their libraries as well. So, so that's uh, going to be where? That's going to be the central library in uh, Auckland. Okay. That'll be where By the, the university. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Lawn Street. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, on the level two is our heritage collections. And we've got our gallery there. And then our, our stuff will go out. And I, uh, I don't know if you know artist uh, Michael Tuffery. Don't know that. So, name. yeah, he's, he's amazing. Uh, he's doing polyfonts at the moment. So mm -hmm. he's done, uh, done a letters especially dedicated to his granddaughters. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we've, we've taken him on as well. There's about five artists that's, that's on board as well, so which is good. We're trying to do a real, a big thing out of this as well, because it's our first heritage specific. Yeah. I think we in New Zealand, being such a young country, um, and perhaps this is reflected in the Pacific as well, don't know enough about the long history. Yes. I watch, um, I was watching something the other day and they had a, a Viking, oh, it was like one of those, sh you know when people bring in, can you value this? It's one of those shows. It was a okay. clip on YouTube. Yeah. And they brought in a, a coin that dated back to the 8th century. Far out. And it was a Viking coin um, that had been pressed in England. Because about that time, around 900, wow. the Vikings kind of controlled sort of London to... Yeah, I was to, watching, I watched the Vikings. Oh, that series? I love that's it. That's awesome, <laughs> eh? Um And I just looked at that and I thought, holy crap, that's, you know, 1,200 years old. Yes. I also remember, and I've told this story before as well, 
about watching one of those renovation shows in the UK, you know, Grand Designs type thing. Yeah. And they were renovating an old cottage. Yeah. And they showed that how this was the original cottage and this was built in 1400. And then this extension was put on in 1600. And then this was, and now they're renovating the whole thing. And they pulled away some of the board yeah. in this 1400 thing. And there was like a sod, you know, like a, a mud wall. Wow. And you could see the handprints. Far out. In this wall where people have gone, you know, yeah. and made it. Made it. And I just thought that handprint has been there from someone who lived six seven hundred years ago just to get some names of those guys you know yeah Yeah. but i think here like we look at a house from the 1840s and go holy crap yeah that's so old that's ancient for us eh? there's a guy um who sadly we haven't actually said this he passed away very quickly guy called ian smith um who came and talked to us in the middle of december last year and passed away in the first week of January. We didn't know he was he was quite gravely ill. He didn't share that with us, but it, oh, we right. were like one of the last people to talk to. Yeah. And he's just done a book um, talking about European settlements in Māori land. In other words, pre-1840 European yeah. settlements. And I just, ever since then, I've been reading his book and I've been thinking about it. We don't know enough about our history and we don't know enough about our long history. That's right. And yeah. especially, I wonder if the Pacific Islands and places like Australia with the Aborigines and Māori as well, obviously, can teach the rest of us about how to hold on to a, a history of more than 200 years, which is what typically in New Zealand people focus on. Yeah. And I guess that's what we're trying to do with this exhibition as well. We're trying to make it um, sort of predominantly the Pacific languages that we're going to do it. And then English is the second sub sort of language that we're going to summarize it in. Mm. Uh, it's, yeah, it's been like, even like I tell most of my friends at home, I came when I was 17 to New Zealand and I've only been working almost three years at the library as an archivist and as well. I've learned, uh, I guess, uh, because in Fiji we were learning literature, but by, you know, Shakespeare and others. Uh, other yeah, it would seem strange, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, it seems strange to me that sitting in Nandi or Suva or somewhere right. and you're reading, you know, <laughs> an English an English play from the 1600s or, yeah. or the exact yeah. date, whenever it was, versus the history of Fiji and the arts and culture of Fiji and That's the right. language of yes. Fiji. Yeah. And I, I mean... You know, and I know that Māori was one, for example, it wasn't a written language, but no. within the Pacific Islands, I guess there's at least a couple of hundred years yeah. of, of written history, surely. Material, material. Uh, yeah, mainly, sort of like I said, chants and writing on yeah. walls and stuff. Yeah, but I was telling my friends, uh, yeah, uh, th- three years I've been in here, I guess I think I've learned more about Fiji's history than I stayed 17 years <laughs> growing up in Fiji as well. And uh, I mean, it's a good thing for me because I'm like, really researching with depth and it's taking me deep and informs my poetry yeah. as well um, as a Pacific poet. And um, yeah, and I just wanted to get it out as well and get people more encouraged because our Pacific people, especially in Auckland, South Auckland, they feel like the libraries are just for clever people or intelligent <laughs> people and they, they're not supposed to come in. And I'm telling them, no, it's, that's not true because we've got most of our stuff waiting for us there. Yep. And our ancestors' stuff just waiting for us to tap into it. And then that's probably my job is to try and connect our communities with our collections and, and stuff like I that. I think part yeah. of that as well is the responsibility of the next generation Yes, the older generation is to get your kids there. That's right. I mean, yeah. when people, if, if, if that's an attitude that libraries are for smart people, then yeah. why would there be a kid section? Like, that's right. Like yeah. my my kids um, are in our Dunedin Library. Yeah. Often and walking out with fifteen books or anything. That's right. But they're all kids books. Yeah. You know, or, or now they're more like YA books, um, that yeah. sort of thing. But but would, that's been a, a pattern in their life forever. So I would hope, without yeah. trying to go yay me, but I would hope. That our kids never think that because they've been going to the library yeah. for their whole lives. Yeah, I think it's it's good for us to try and get people our age, especially for Pacific and Maori, yeah. to encourage their kids to do more of that, come to the library because it was them who were the insecure ones who were saying, "Oh no, right. you know, they could say they weren't educated much. Now, you know, most of them worked in factories or whatever, and they never really, you know, connected with our our, our libraries and stuff." But uh, I think the young kids nowadays are coming slowly towards that as well because most of us are trying to push that, and especially in Auckland and South Auckland. In around New Zealand, in, in the Pacific, yeah. So the generation before you, uh, let's say it's the equivalent of the boomer age generation, but yeah. from the Pacific Island, it's interesting what you just said. You know, um, I understand what you're saying. I remember when I was growing up in the 80s, you know, being a fan yeah. of rugby, spent a fair bit of time at the Ponsonby Rugby Club. Yeah. You know, within Ponsonby in that, in yeah. those days, it was a lot of um, migrants from the islands That's right, who came into India. that area. Yeah. Um, how, I feel like... I feel like you know this, there's this kind of European um, attitude of superiority 
Yeah. Like now our skill set needs to be if you can, you know, draw a straight line or if you can write a pretty word or yeah. if you can, you know, whatever, that's what we value. Yeah. And so there was a whole generation of migrants who came to this country who probably weren't valued. Yeah. Because their skill set didn't Listen. fit in with, I guess, the colonial style the of doing yes. things. Yeah. How do we change that for the next generation if we haven't done so already? Or, or is there a change coming that actually values values the poetry, values the music? And not yeah. just the poetry and the music, because, you know, everyone values Lord's music yes, because she's yes. had number one hits in America. Oh, she's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nothing away from Lord, yeah. but values the 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 um you know the music that plays at yeah. the at the Otara markets yeah on a Saturday morning or that plays down here in Dunedin at our farmers festival there's a Vanuatu band that plays there often oh, right. and they're freaking awesome Amazing. yeah oh wow <laughs> is there something changed or is it changing how we should we should changing. and are valuing that yeah I think our children are getting more uh, sort of educated as well through us I mean through you know like I said I came and uh, I had to start busking mm. like now we can give it on to them and they can just run with it and. I have been, like in the last 10 years of SEPSI, South Auckland Poets Collective, we've seen 36 poets come through there. Mm. And most of them have gone overseas. And they were marginalized youth, Pacific youth, Pacific and Maori youth. And now they are in amazing places around, um, yeah, around in New Zealand and around the world. And and I've just seen the next generation just building and growing. And I guess because we've got our people and we've got institutions that support that and technology as well that can do a lot of good things apart from other stuff as well. But yeah. And I, th- I think the next generation will make a real difference for us as well. And, and yeah, in terms of sort of making more conscious about our culture and our, well, it depends on what they really tap into because they can get really political as well or yeah. really artsy, but just de- depending on their messages and stuff. And yeah, really, I, I guess we just still have to encourage that as well. Mm-hmm. I think there also needs to be a fundamental change in the education system. Yes, if they can make it like part of a curriculum, but which is good because uh, the, um, uh, word the frontline. That's a big thing in um, in Auckland, and they do it in all schools now. And it's like a poetry slam. It is yeah. a poetry slam. So they took the first group to Brave New Voices uh, last year, which is uh, the biggest poetry slam in the world, wow, cool. and that's in America. And this is only for young people up to the age of maybe eighteen, high school. And uh, yeah, what's they, it called? What's the thing called? It's called Brave New Voices in uh, America. Have a squeeze of that, bro. Yeah, Brave New Voices. Otherwise, even slam. look at uh, Word the Frontline. If, if you got them, then they will show you some awesome Aotearoa young poets. Maybe those guys. Look at yeah. that. Brave New Voices, BNV, is the International right. Youth Poetry Slam Festival. The thing about this as well, talking about the... Um, talking about... Why don't you just put, put one of those videos on, put it on the background. We probably have to be careful about you know breaking any kind of copyright, but I'm sure 10 seconds or something would look all right. Um, so they have like, I don't know, up to maybe 50 different teams that compete from around America and London and in the world and I think New Zealand had the first one last year and they came somewhere like second I think wow yeah so when you say teams is it a group of three four five yeah so they got just uh, give us 10 seconds there's some volume on that oh I, I don't think I don't know if the sound's working all right that's fine um so up to 19 year olds and yeah so they they're young and they're doing amazing words uh, we, we we took our first south auckland poets to um the brave new voices in 2012 yeah and uh, we went as adults and just observe observing the the groups and then last year was the biggest move because that was our dream yeah to take our first new zealand team and and become something because yeah. the hawaiians were doing it and um yeah they were doing really well too it seems um to me that the education system needs to make a pretty dramatic shift yep. into places of the skill set the next generation needs is finding information, not knowing information. As soon as the internet came along yep. and everything you ever wanted to know was available to you for free. Instant, yeah. Um, and now with these things, it's not just available to you for free, it's available to you for free in your pocket. Yeah. Education, to my mind, used to be about memorizing things. That's right, Ed. yeah. That's right. Why do you need to memorize anything today when every answer to every question is sitting here? <laughs> That's right, Ed. And I don't think the education system is caught up with the change in society. And things like giving kids the ability to grow in their creativity, in my mind, is more important than understanding Pythagoras' theorem. You know, why... Yeah. I mean... 
I have to be careful because my kids might watch this. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> but, um, you know, my timers tables aren't as important today as they used to be because yeah. I have a That's calculator true. in here that can power a space shuttle. Yeah. Um, I mean, I remember when I was with those lovely Christian brothers at St. Peter's College, yeah. having to stand up, whole classroom standing up, stand behind our chairs with our hands out, and the lovely Christian brother would go around and go, six fours. And if you didn't go 24, he'd have a strap and he'd go, from, well, bang. Oh, we come from the same generation. <laughs> <laughs> we were like this with a ruler. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, A... We all knew our time tables. <laughs> yeah, that's that, right. It worked. Oh, you'd be in trouble, yeah. But it was a rote thing. It wasn't a... And I mean, maths is a bit different because maths doesn't really have yeah. necessarily a context for why something equals what it equals. It just does. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we were just talking about Shakespeare and I'm going like, where's that from? Yeah. I can look it up now. I can look it up with the characters from Mid Summer Night's Dream. Where was... Uh, Titania from which, which I can look it up. Yeah, I don't need to have learned not like as before. Much. Yeah, we had to. So it seems that society has changed so much that now all information is available at all times for free. Yeah, that the education sector needs to change about accessing information and about releasing creativity. I think though, if if the education system was able to focus on those two things, yeah, we would see a change in that generation, like. Like yeah. nothing else, whichever generation they happen for. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, and I guess that's what um, because we do stuff in schools as well. Mm -hmm. Michael uh, King Writer Centre sort of hires most of our poets to go into schools and and sort of yeah, um, get them to publish their work or get them to perform their works and stuff like that. And I think that's that's getting more sort of um, mileage as well nowadays. Yeah, and like you said, it's everything's in, in our fingertips at the moment and. Um, it's a good thing as well, and then it could make us a bit more like, oh, you know, we'll just leave it. We're not in the same practices as before when we didn't have technology. Because even coming from the islands, I never even had a. <laughs> I had my first McDonald's in in my first burger oh, when I was eight, first burger, first 17, 17 years old. Yes, wow. first McDonald's, first burger, first KFC, and then, you know, and that's the real difference from where I was growing up and coming here as well. Mm. I think that's a yeah, it just shows how much. Our kids nowadays can get, you know, and, and even when I'm looking at my boys, I'm like, man, when I was your age, I didn't actually, I would be happy if I had chicken for, you know, for Christmas. And I, I didn't wow. care about real much about presents, you know. Yeah, going back another generation, my mum used to always tell the story of one of the things she got at Christmas was an orange. And there was. Because oranges in the 19, I guess that was 40s and 50s. Yeah. They were a luxury. So That's she true. got an orange at Christmas. Yeah. We've now got, you know, veggie stores around Dunedin. Very good value. You couldn't go and get oranges from California, a bag yeah. of them for three, four, five dollars. That's right. Yeah. 24 7, 365. Yeah. And the same with my grandmother. She would go shopping and we have all the tropical fruits, mangoes, and, and the, but she would buy us an apple. Right. And they'll be like, oh, wow, that's a tree. Apples don't grow in yeah, Fiji. Apples don't grow. All the pears and apples, the fruit that we have here doesn't grow in the islands eh? ah. because of the, the, the weather. And then there was like a big treat for us, you know. And But nowadays we buy something for them. They're like, oh, why didn't you get the other? Yeah. It's like, wow. Which this one of these seven yeah, varieties right. of apples would you like? <laughs> <laughs> All for $1.99 yeah, a kilo. <laughs> So, yeah, it's so different now. Yeah. It is interesting, though, because I, I realize what I've just said about education is um, too black and white. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, a kid could hear that and go, well, I don't have to learn then. Everything's right. easy. I'm not yeah. saying that. I'm just saying that I think if there was a skew in the education sector, it, it's, it's been towards yep. remembering, remembering formulas and memorizing. That's right. And yeah. now we don't need to remember, so it needs to shift with it. I'm not saying, like I'm not, like I still, I was taught when I was, again, in Form 1, which yeah. is year, whatever the hell that is now, 7, I think, in our new system. Yeah. Um, I was taught that pi... Um, which we think of as three point one four, yeah. but I was thought I was taught it was twenty two over seven. It was a fraction. All oh, right, because I had a really old Christian brother guy who strapped us. Yeah, so pi was twenty two over seven. So if you divide twenty two by seven, yeah, it's three point one four. You know, it's the oh, way. But right. it means that actually, because I know that I can do things like pi r squared in my head fairly easily. Wow, because it's easier to do it as twenty two over seven than it is three point one four. So I'm not suggesting that learning things and memorizing things is a bad thing. So you're good at uh, maths and stuff. That's I, th really, I think really I think maths me. was always my strongest thing. <laughs> oh, that's I great. I, a lot of other, I'm dyslexic, so a lot of the other stuff wasn't quite so up there, but. Okay. Um, math was always one that was was strong for me. 
pro- and probably and because of that guy who sh- probably that guy who strapped us when I was in year yeah. seven. That's probably yeah. why. Yeah, I was scared of the Morris brothers as well. <laughs> it's like I have to do my homework, otherwise it's you know. They took yeah. corporal punishment out of schools yeah. when I was about form three, form four. Oh, okay, so you still had it um, younger. Eh? But I think the mistake they made in the government, which is always baby with the bathwater, is there was these teachers who'd been in schools for 30, 40, 50 years, and that had been their go-to discipline. Yeah. And at December of one year, it was there. January of the next year, it wasn't. wasn't. But they hadn't done any retraining of these teachers who had been there for 30 oh, and 40 years. So they're used years. to doing that. So they yeah. had no other skill set. They had no other skills for disciplining a classroom yeah. other than threats of violence. <laughs> That's right. The cane of the... <laughs> <That's> horrible. <laughs> threats of violence. What mm. year but was it? They changed? I'm, I'm pretty sure I, I was... I got strapped in intermediate school. Um... And that would have been 84, 85. Far right, yeah. Um, but I didn't get strapped in secondary school. So mid-80s was when, you can probably Google that, mid, mid-80s was when corporal punishment would have gone. But yeah, there was a whole group of, especially these you know Christian brothers, Yeah. because oh, because yeah. it was spare they the rod. They were brutal, those guys. <laughs> but it was, it was spare the rod, spoil the child, you That's know. Right, yeah. So they had nothing. So I think there was a, a generation of kids who probably came through the school in the mid to middle 80s to mid-90s who might have come up against teachers who just couldn't control their classes because they hadn't yeah. been given the skill set. skill set, yeah. Yeah, that kind of stuff. And not used to the kids, like, answering back and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Because when I came, I went to seventh form at, uh, yeah, year 13 at uh, Newlands College. Right, in Wellington. Yeah, and I was, I was so uh, sort of shocked by the way they used to answer the teachers, even using swear words. I was like, if that was Fiji, we'd get smashed. <laughs> yeah. It's like, far out, yeah. Well, I guess, in, I mean, uh, yeah. I guess in Fiji, it'd be a different style yeah. of discipline again and then, still. And they still, yeah, corporate punishment is still there, even still in there Samoa. <laughs> it's like, now we're in Samoa, guys. You, you're allowed, you, if you do any mistake, <laughs> wow. remember there's the, the road there's there as well. So, uh, yeah. It's funny, eh? It's it's talking about corporate punishment and discipline. And I think about things like smacking and the, yeah. you know, the smacking laws that changed in New Zealand. Is occasionally, like I had a, I, I knew someone, I won't mention names because I don't want them to feel bad. Fair enough. But came from Australia. Yeah. Uh, where, Smacking That's was right, completely fine. Yeah. It was different. and and to hear that parent smack their child like in the last five years, yeah. I was just like, oh my god, what's yeah. going on? What's going on? <laughs> right, this is yeah. not wrong. What's happening? <laughs> yeah. Because you just don't see it or hear it anymore. Yeah. And there'll be a group of people out there that go, "That's been the downfall of society." It's yeah, not. That's right. wow. This yeah. is um, yeah. 1990 July. Oh, was that when it was? Out? Okay, well maybe my school just decided then. So it was outlawed in 1990. 1990. That feels like yesterday. Yeah. I came in 92, so yeah. I, I just uh, missed out by five years. No, no snack in school. For you. At primary school, I remember my cousin. Oh, you're lucky, Tom. <laughs> my cousin used to tell me stories of him getting the cane at primary school. He's the same year at my school. I never, ever got any kind of court punishment at primary school. Could you imagine taking the cane to like a five or a six or a seven year old? <laughs> Could you imagine that? But, um, yeah, it's pretty seen, messed up. I've seen really, it happen. Pretty messed up. <laughs> but not, not, not here. Growing up, yeah. So, what are you in Dunedin for? Dunedin, I'm here actually to support my wife. She's here to do um, something for, yeah, for the Labour Party. So, you, we haven't mentioned this yet. Your wife is Carmel Sopolon. Carmel Sopolon, yeah, yeah. She's the Minister for yeah, Social Development, Disability, yeah. and Associate Minister for um, Ministry of Pacific Peoples and um, Art, Heritage, and Culture. Nice. Yeah, so she's down here. I'm yeah. I'm normally supporting her. I'm I'm the big carrier and the the children look after fella. So you're not you're not performing or doing anything while you're down here because I found out about you from um part of me from the guys at the Fringe Festival. Obviously yes. they knew you were coming through. You're not actually doing anything? No, not on this one. I brought the South Auckland Poets Collective uh, down here in 2011 mm-hmm. and we performed here and uh, yeah so that was probably the last time at the Fringe but I, yeah I'm good friends with all uh, most of them uh, Koile is the band I'm looking forward to mm-hmm. which is this afternoon at the markets from 3 to um, 3 4 30 so uh, yeah that's what I'm going to do I'm just looking at that and um, yeah just in the pipeline for for writing and publishing as well so the markets are going to be because normally the markets if I'm right Tom wrap up around midday there's an extension going on today yes it? I think so because ah. uh, I hope so. Because, yeah, <laughs> that's where they're like supposed to be jamming. Thieves Street Market. Oh, Thieves, Thieves Alley. Oh, is that another? Yeah, that's market. a different one. Thieves oh. Alley is they close off the Octagon and Princess Street, and yeah, that's different. So the market is the farmers market. Okay, that happens every Saturday morning, oh, which is a, is a must see. Yeah, 
if people come to Dunedin, you have to go to the farmer's market. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. But then today is Thieves Alley. Thieves Alley. I don't know where okay. that came from, but if you go around the octagon, right there, yeah. like um, one side of the octagon is uh, Princess Street, the other side is George Street. They yeah. block off like a block each way. Yeah. And it's like all stalls and that'll that'll be where they're performing. Okay. And they cool. set up there's probably a stand set up in the in the octagon. Yes. So that's there you're saying. Okay, that'll, cool. that'll be it. That'll be the spot. Eh? Yeah, it's great yeah. actually. Thieves Alley's great. Good yeah, fun. Awesome. So so this you say Carmel's got a, a stand set up at the moment yeah, down there's at the a farmer's labor, market. Yeah. Down at the farmer's market and uh, I think yeah, they finish off probably at one o'clock or just after yeah, one. Yeah. yeah. And and are they gonna be putting something up at the at the other one as well, do you know? I don't know what's happening on the other no. one. Um, yeah, I'm just following. You can tell it's an election year, can't you? I don't know if I've ever seen a uh, Labour or a Green <laughs> tent at the markets before. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, I hardly come down to Dunedin, but yeah, we do it like most Saturdays, Sundays up in Auckland. Yeah, because there's markets there. But um, yeah, yeah, down here I don't know how that works. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. And are you someone who gets involved politically, or are you a bag carrier for your missus? I'm the bag carrier. Bro. <laughs> yeah, I'm just a poet. She's the politician, so uh, yeah. We just do a balanced thing, and yeah. Do you, it must be it must be a it must be a benefit of living in Auckland though. Like I, I speak to some MPs who are down in this sort of area, and they're like they they leave Dunedin on a Monday and they come back on a Thursday, spending oh, the she's, week. She's the same as yeah. well because uh, she, oh, because she goes to Wellington, of course. Yeah, so in Auckland she comes to Wellington Monday to Thursday, and then yeah comes back as well. It makes you think uh, being an MP in Wellington would be the place to go, wouldn't it? That's right. Eh? You just live in your own home for yeah, those times. Then don't have to go too far. Yeah. So the, you guys, so is she doing some travel around the country for the election year? Because she's obviously Kelston based, isn't she? Yes. Oh, she's always traveling and she's always doing stuff, even on recess weeks. I guess there. as a minister, that's a part of the part of yeah, the deal, isn't it? And, and overseas as well. So yeah, it depends on which trips as well. And Get some nice junkets out of the way. Sorry? Take the partner along for a few junkets. Yes. Yeah, no, no, that's good. I've been to Chathams, I've been to Stewart Island and stuff oh, like cool. that, which is great, yeah. And I can choose uh, functions that I go to as well. I guess because we've got a young family too, so yeah. No, it's, so it's yeah, so, is that, so you just, you you play daddy daddy at home whilst Carmel's come off away. And she's got her, her dad and I've got my mum as well. So right. if, if I'm doing my art stuff, at least our, our kids can go to their grandparents and stuff like that. So it really helps out in, yeah, for us, especially our lifestyle. So you're doing work at the the library at the moment and you're organising things with the university. Yeah. Are you performing at the moment? Like are you uh, are you someone who regularly gets up and, and performs? Yes, and I guess the it's all coming up and it's mainly performing for poetry. And yeah, and then on the side I've, I'm doing a research research revival project called Ulumate project and it's the old traditional uh, wig making of uh, so we went uh, we've been supported by Creative New Zealand so we went over to London last year and I've got an exhibition coming up in response to that visit to London so that that exhibition will yeah. it be like mostly wigs <laughs> um, mainly the photos of the wigs that I uh, handled in um, in England at right. the uh, Cambridge um, Museum, right? And we're making masks for f to to make faces for those wigs because those wigs is, hasn't been practiced for over two hundred years in Fiji, and I've been growing my hair for this is about twenty four years now. Yeah, and I, we will be making a modern day ulumate in twenty twenty two. So what's an ulumate? Ulumate is a traditional itoke Fijian uh, wig making okay. process, and then normally it's done when uh, time of mourning. You cut your hair and you make it into a wig, and you wear it till your hair underneath grows back. So um, oh. this is, yeah, and I saw the first one in uh, Auckland Museum in 2013 and then that's where I started to get sort of the idea. I was just about to cut my dreads after 17 years of uh, growing them and normally we take it back to the islands and just uh, bury them and plant a coconut tree maybe on top of it. But uh, I saw that wig and I thought, oh, this is this is a calling for me as well. To, yeah. the, um, you talk, we talked a bit about the Pacific <coughs> stories. Yeah. What's the story behind that? I mean, that sounds... From the outside looking in, that you cut your hair off, yeah, and then you wear your hair as a wig, yeah, while your hair regrows, regrows, yeah. So what's the story? What's the significance behind it? Uh, well, that's the mourning period, which is hundred nights. So you keep that wig on for the hundred nights, and yeah. by the time you take it off, it's it's going back. There's three types of wigs. That's one. That is sort of a ulumati wig. The uludavu is the the one you scalp your your enemy, <laughs> and you wear it to the next war. And the third one is the uluvati, which is the uh, god's wig, uh, spirit. That you you adorn your god with, and yeah, I think that's the most sort of crafted ones. And uh, outside of Fiji, Fiji's got six, but the Cambridge got eight in in London. So that's why we went to London too. So, so there's that's fourteen. Are you saying there's only fourteen wigs? No, there's actually more in the world, but it's not. Fiji's only got six. There's like wow. two in New, two in Auckland, uh, one in Auckland, one in Te Papa. Yeah, there's one in Melbourne and uh, another museum in Australia. So this yeah. would have been something that. 
every Fijian did, you know, 500 years ago? Yeah, not every, but uh, different villages would have practiced that, uh, yeah. And but, mainly the guys from the highland. And of all of that, yeah. there's only six individual wigs left in... In, in Fiji, in Silver, in that's Silver Museum. Yes. terrible. Yeah, so... So that means, <laughs> that makes me think about repatriating stuff back to Fiji. I know that yeah. Māori, for example, if they find... You know, Tonga offshore, they often yeah. try and bring it back. Is that something that's yeah. that's part of the Fijian culture? Are you trying to get things back? We were back? discussing that as well. But I guess with Maori, it's awesome because we, we've got uh, facilities here in New Zealand to keep them. Mm. But for me, from uh, my experience of going back home and looking at our museums and the way we treat our Taongas, I, I think it's better to be in those spaces until we find a, right. a proper location. So you let the, them look after them for a yeah, while. Because the conservation and preservation is really lacking in, those, right. uh, in our islands since it's been a developing country sort of third world it's just put in the inside the <laughs> inside the drawers and then pull it out but every year you put gloves and you know you have that yeah, yeah i guess they're stepping up slowly in the islands but yeah we need to sort of sort of sort of collaborate with overseas and see how we can do that better and how um, did they get from fiji to london to yeah UK? traders uh right. missionaries and uh yeah so Captain Cook and his gang took some, and uh, there was this guy. That's how they started the Cambridge uh, University Museum of Anthropology and Archaeology. This guy's this guy called uh, von Hugel, Aristotle. He was the one who took most of those collections from Fiji and right. started up that museum in London. And um, his his thing was to be the curator of that museum and to to. to was that done? Display. Was that done back in the day, like uh, uh, for good reasons? Did they say we want to? keep and treasure and hold these things or did they nick them because they were cool <laughs> i guess because they were cool and they, uh, they wanted to yeah so it wasn't ever like a we need it, uh, it wasn't philanthropic it wasn't like we need to make sure this doesn't go anywhere it was more like like yeah. the the huia bird in new zealand is a classic example it's yeah. devastating that i think it was king george because obviously maori considered the huia bird to be sacred and the yes. feathers to be sacred yeah and i think one was given to king george yeah and then you know the the hoi puloi in the UK yeah. saw King George had one, so they all wanted one. They wanted one, yeah. and that Even was tapa, the, and that uh, was the extinction of the huia bird. That's right, never yeah. to be seen again. Yeah, so that was a crap reason for them to go offshore. That's right. I, I mean, most of the reasons wasn't really uh, wasn't good reasons for right. taking them, but uh, yeah. I guess it was more of like, oh, see what I've done, see how far I've gone, right? See what I've brought back, you know. Look what look what these yeah, natives have done. I've done. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, so but it would be nice to get it back in in. Fijian hands if that could happen. Yes, eventually, hopefully in this yeah in this lifetime as well. Uh, I'd like to do. I'd like to see that happen. You've yeah. also seems to have some involvement with, you know, Maori Maori dim Maori issues that sort of thing. And yeah. is it there's a close connection between all Pacific people in that way? Yes. Or do you have a particular, um, you know, focus and desire to to help and be involved in Maori issues? Um, I support a lot of Maoris, and I, I'm always respectful of this land because this is where I developed my skills and my and became a man as well. And uh, I'm always talking them whatever they do and this exhibition is by myself and uh, our maori curator who's actually shown me around all our collections he's been with the library for 19 years oh, wow. in heritage collections so i want to send a shout out to uh, robert eruera ratu ropati yeah he's been awesome and yeah i mean i support them in, uh, I, in anything they do as well and just hopefully yeah things things work out and for all of us anyway yeah you know little struggles yeah Hey, well, it's been fantastic to meet you. You too, Pat. Thank you so much for It's been a lot of fun. And look, I mean, whenever you're back in town, you should definitely come say hi. I will. And certainly you. if you're performing and stuff, you've got anything going on. Okay. We want to hear from you. Yeah. Um, And enjoy Thieves Alley this afternoon. I will, man. I'm looking it's forward to that. It's good fun. Yeah, all sorts of, I don't want to use a word that some good people could say, them derogatory but it's got Thieves Alley's got kind of a gypsy feel to it you know it's that kind of there's lots of cool stores and little oh, knickknacks cool. to buy and yeah. you know we have the gypsy fear come through the travelling guys every year they, they yeah. travel around the whole country I guess but it's sort of a version of that and lots of oh, nice. funky little arts and crafts and will that be fair Tom how I've described it yeah yeah so, <laughs> I interviewed the steampunk society they're going to be there selling oh, crazy nice. steampunk things oh well. cool I'll keep an eye out <laughs> Great. All right. If people want to find out more about your poetry or, or what you're doing or the upcoming exhibitions, yeah. where can they go? What can um, they do? There'll be Auckland uh, Libraries uh, online, aucklandlibraries.com. And uh, yeah, I've, I've got a Facebook page and stuff like that. Uh, and I'm, my books are on Amazon. Is that one of the wigs out of interest? Yeah, that is my hair. My well, that's your hair? Yeah, so I chopped it after 17 years in that photo that was taken in 2014 before I went to the States. And uh, yeah, so that's that's my hair that I'll be making into a ulu. 
That so one. you chopped it up after 17? After 17 years of growing them. Yeah. So, and then this is my third, my third attempt here. So I've grown my hair since then for four years. Yep. Cut last uh, 2018 and then I've been growing since 2019. Amazing. For the last year. So that's poetryfoundation.org. But like you said, I think we've been putting up your um, Facebook uh, thing during the during the cool. people can come yes. find oh, you there. That's great. Yeah, I'm on the arts page there, the DK Poet. Yeah. Yep, there we go. DK cool. Pacific Poet. People look that up, they'll find out more yeah. about you. Cool. Cool. Darren Kamali, hey, thank you so much for coming. It's been a yes, pleasure sir. to meet you and um, enjoyed Dunedin today. It's a great day for it. Thank you, Pat and Tom. Cheers.